in the book of Revelation for tonight. Once again in chapter 7, beginning in verses 9, John said, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the things that I want to point out in those verses right there, and we looked a little bit at this last Wednesday evening about this great multitude. Who is this great multitude? And we're going to see in a minute these are peoples that will be saved during the days of the uh, tribulation, uh, during the times that people will be, many will be martyred for their faith. Notice it's a great multitude, which the word great there emphasizes uh, the, enormous, uh, the enormous amount of people there. And notice of all nations, I alluded to the fact the other evening that the 144,000 uh, will not be the only Jews that are saved during the tribulation. There will be many Jews that will be saved. It speaks there of all nations and notice they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Notice how they're clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders. Remember we referred to the elders being the church and the 24 elders being rem, uh, representative of that, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. One of the things that I want to point out in verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, notice the word thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And in that great doxology of praise there, as they are gathered, this great host, this great number, and of course, all of those that are represented there in heaven, if you can only imagine how the strains of the sounds of those voices, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Notice in the phrasing of that, each one of those words, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, might, be to our God, notice, forever and ever. Amen. In verse 13, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? Notice what John says in verse 14, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Notice what they did, and washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, these are people that have died for their faith, have uh, not taken the mark of the beast of the Antichrist, the one world uh, dictator, but these are they, he says, that come out of the great tribulation, and washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. Notice what they do and serve him day and night in his temple. Notice the word there, temple, 
we sometimes don't realize it, but there in heaven, there's a temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore and thirst anymore. Notice this great multitude. Many of these people not only died because of their faith, but they died because of hunger, because of starvation, because they were not able to buy. They were not able to sell during that period of time because they did not take the mark of the beast, the Antichrist. And if you will remember, those who take the mark of the Antichrist will be able to buy and sell during the days of the tribulation. You can only imagine how that those that will not have access to buy food, to buy water, notice how that many of these will have died because of starvation, a lack of food. They will die, many of them, because of a lack of hydration and water. Many of them will die because they've given their lives in martyrdom and they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 16, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. Notice it says, They shall not strike them, nor any heat. The sun shall not strike them. One of the things that's going to happen during the days of the tribulation will be the intensity of the sun beaming upon this earth. Tonight, one of the reasons you and I don't freeze to death during the winter is because of the distance of the sun. One of the reasons that we don't burn up during the summers because of the right distance of where the sun is and its gravitation around the earth. And one of the things that is going to be uh, in the sun, the moon, and the stars, as Luke's gospel shares that there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. If you can only imagine here in verse 16, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. If you can only imagine that the heat waves and uh, the portion of the sun that will be in great intensity and will be scorching people as well. Verse 17 says, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne, that is the Lamb, Jesus Christ, for the Lamb who's in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them, notice, to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. All of the things that they have been through, all of the things that they have experienced, during this time of great tribulation upon the earth. Let me tell you, when they get home to heaven, they'll never have to worry about food or hunger or starvation or thirst, but they will be led to the living fountains of waters. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. If you can only imagine, if you were John, you were out in the Aegean Sea and you were riding under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is breathing out this great prophetic message and John pins this down. John could not even begin to fathom in his finite mind. John could not begin to even comprehend all of these things that the Holy Spirit is breathing through the pen of his hand as he takes these things down. John could not even begin to imagine all of these particular things. And so with some of the symbolism that is here and what it is representative of, and we see this great multitude that are saved out of the great tribulation and they have washed the robes in the blood of of the land, the Lamb. No wonder God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
once they get home, once they get to heaven, let me tell you, there will not be any of the worries anymore that they've had in this lifetime. I don't know about you, but several of the things that have been on television, on the History Channel, the uh, Science Channel, National G, uh, Geographic, and various things, they've done several documentaries and past days upon things. I heard a minister the other night on one of those uh, stations out of uh, uh, TBN preaching and talking about the 144,000. And as we consider this great chapter in chapter 7, remember it started out that uh, there were four angels and they were standing at the four corners of the earth. And they were fixing to strike the trees and the water and the grass. And a fifth angel comes out and says, don't touch any of those things until we have sealed these 144,000 with God's seal. And then all through that, he describes in verses 5 through 8, he names the tribes of the children of Israel. And that these... Uh, Evangelists will be chosen out of these 12 tribes of the sons of Jacob, 12,000 from each of the tribes. And then we see that through their ministry, uh, through their sharing, that a great ho host of people, a great multitude of people are receiving Christ. I think I alluded to the fact uh, last uh, Wednesday evening that there are a lot of people that keep believing and thinking there's going to be uh, one of the greatest revivals in all of uh, uh, Christendom uh, out there. But I think the great revival that is going to come will be during the days of the tribulation. There may be spurts of revivals here and there and across the country and across the continents and all of those kinds of things. And there will be revivals, of course. There always have been, there always will be some, but I think the great revival will be during the days of the tribulation. I don't think that we're going to see that type of revival that many are hoping and looking for to happen. I believe if it did, we would have seen the great revivals happen after some of the world wars that have happened, and uh, we saw what happened at 9-11 for a few weeks thereafter, churches began to ring the bells and churches began to be flooded with people for just two or three weeks. But after that, it was short-lived. And for some of those reasons, I believe that the great revival is coming during the days of the great tribulation. When you get to chapter 8, I want to read verse 1 and uh, we're not going to delve all the way into chapter 8 tonight, but notice the seventh seal. We started out with the judgments that are going to fall upon the earth. We started out in chapters 6 and 5, 6 and 7 and through there talking about these judgment seals. Remember Jesus from the line of the tribe of Judah he takes the seven-sealed scroll. No one was worthy and but one, and that was Jesus. He takes the seven-sealed scroll. It is the title deed to this earth. And with each unwinding of the seals, there are judgments going to fall upon the earth. And we've looked at those in the seal judgments, the first six seals. Well, when you get to the uh, seventh seal and you open that up, that's where the next judgments come out of that sixth seal. The trumpet judgments now are given. So the seventh seal is a prelude to the seven trumpets. John says, when he opened, he, speaking of the Lamb, Jesus, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now, if I'd walked out here tonight up on the platform and just stared at you, 
didn't say a word for 30 minutes. You would say, what in creation? This happened, his brain froze. He's in a brain freeze. He's having a senior moment. You know, and every one of us would feel awkward, wouldn't we? You would wonder, what should I do? Should I run up and check to see if, if there's still a pulse in the pastor's wrist? But let me tell you, in this eighth chapter, verse one, if you can only imagine, silence is deafening, isn't it? Silence is deafening because we are so used to living, to, to live in a world that is filled with all kinds of clatter and all types of busyness and, and talk and, and all of those kinds of things. But in this eighth chapter in the first verse, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. Let me tell you, silence before all of the great things that are going to take place cataclysmically in the days of the tribulation. Last Wednesday night, I believe it was, or last Sunday night, one of those two, we talked about um, 2022 AP7, uh, the big asteroid that they recently saw that was hidden from view because of the sun's rays and all of that. And that asteroid, that rock out there floating in the heavenlies, uh, would be a about the size of the Pentagon and Washington, D.C. And I made the comment that some 27, 2,800 satellites that, that um, orbit the earth, well, let me correct myself, because two nights ago on one of the uh, science channels, there are 6,000 satellites that are, that are orbiting the world. It's amazing. From there, they could pinpoint. And uh, they were doing a lot of uh, excavation in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. And as they were unearthing some of those where kings had been buried. It was phenomenal to see those satellites as they can pinpoint to this very earth and see all of the things that are out there that they want to explore from space up there. Let me tell you, if you think you are living in privacy, you're not. I can assure you of that. Your cell phones, they listen. If you have Alexa, if you have some of those things, they hear what's happening. They know how to turn your cell phone on if they want to turn on and listen to your conversation. The other night I was trying to listen to some of that and all of a sudden my uh, the sound on my television went off, and I began to punch all the buttons, mute and unmute, and do everything that I knew to do. And uh, then I reached up and I clicked Alexa and said, Would you please turn the sound on my TV immediately? The sound is on. It's amazing that 6,000 satellites that are orbiting the earth, pinpointing objects for archaeologists and people that study the formations of the earth and to be able to see even below the earth many of the things that are out there. As we look at these trumpet judgments, as we look at these sealed judgments, and to think about all of the oceans one of these days, in one of these judgments, a third of the ships are going to be destroyed. If you can only imagine what that will do to navigation and to the naval uh, military, what it will do to commerce, 
when things are being taken to and from various places. And from what I understand with all of the oceans and the waters of the world today, there have been thousands of shipwrecks that have never been discovered that lie buried on the bottom of the ocean floors. And I think about only about 5%, if I remember correctly, only about 5% have ever been discovered. So you can understand that on the bottom floors of the oceans and the seas out there, plane crashes, wartime crashes, uh, Titanic ships and vessels that have sunk in past history. And when you get to some of these judgments that are going to affect the land and the water and life and population, we've already seen in one part of these where a fourth of the earth, the population dies due to war and bloodshed and plagues and diseases and all kinds of things that will be taking place. You'll see how the water systems of the world will become poisoned and non-drinkable. And I think I alluded to the fact the other day that most of the safe drinking water in the world is here in America. There are a lot of places in the world, in third world countries, where they do not have water. Let me tell you, water is a precious commodity. You and I need to be thankful. We need to be grateful. Every drop of water that you drink, you ought to pause and say, Lord, thank you, God. There's coming a day according to your word when the world is going to be in dire straits when it comes to the commodity of food and of water. Let me tell you, the body cannot sustain life without the various organs being depleted and deteriorating without hydration of the body. That's why it's so vitally important that people keep hydrated. And there are coming days for those that will experience these judgments that are going to fall upon the earth one of these days. And in this very first verse of chapter 8, when silence in heaven, tonight there's rejoicing all over heaven. There's rejoicing when someone gets saved, the Bible says. The angels of heaven that know nothing about salvation but desire to look into it. The angels of heaven rejoice when someone gets saved. There's rejoicing going on in heaven tonight. But during the days of the great tribulation, there's going to come a moment where all of heaven is silent for the space of about half an hour. It's a calm before the storm. It signals a great alert of things that are going to happen. Unfortunately, when you comb your way through the book of Revelation and to find out, you would think, you would think that the lost of this world would fall on their knees and ask for forgiveness and to receive Christ. But unfortunately, that will not be the case. Unfortunately, they will still be cursing and blaspheming the God of heaven when these things are going on. Notice in verse 2, and I'm going to close for tonight, we'll pick up here on Wednesday night. John said, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. You will remember the number seven in biblical numerology is it stands for completeness. And do you notice how that the book of Revelation is filled with angels? I mentioned that this morning in Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits? 
that will minister to those who will inherit salvation. God uses these angels, these created angels, God uses them to help in these end time events of judgments that are coming as well as he uses them all throughout human history. But these angels were created for a purpose. They were created for a reason and God will use them as he carries forth his judgments upon the earth. Notice verse 3, then another angel having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Let me tell you, all of the prayers you've ever prayed, God still knows them. God still has them. And when we pick up on Sunday evening, we'll talk more about verse 2. And verse 3 here, but all of a sudden, this scene opens in chapter 8, when this seventh seal opens, which is the prelude to the seven trumpet judgments that are coming upon this earth one of these days, and all of heaven is silent for about 30 minutes. It's the alert. It's what is fixing to take place upon the earth as God judges the heart of unrepentant man. And God gives this opportunity for people to be saved. It's going to be a tragic, tragic time for people that are left behind. I know there are people that think, those of us that believe the Bible, that believe these things. There are many out there that think that we're Looney Tune. But I can assure you, when God sent the flood in the book of Genesis and he closed the ark's door with Noah and seven other of his family members in there, they didn't think Noah was Looney Tuned after that. They began to scream and shout and beg and cry but it was too late. Noah had preached to them a hundred years. Noah had told them what was going to happen, but they didn't believe him. 120 years he preached. He didn't have any converts, just his family. But let me tell you, on a certain day, at a certain moment, at a certain time, God told Noah and his family to enter the ark, and the door was closed. The rains began to descend and the ark began to lift through the buoyancy of the water and, and people began to drown. Folks, let me tell you, one of these days when all of a sudden Christians all over the world will be gone from this place, you can only imagine how frightening that's going to be. You can only imagine how disturbing that is going to be to a world that will not even know what on earth has happened or what is about to take place. But let me tell you, Satan will have his man in the wings who will come forward that will seemingly have all of the answers. And then these judgments will begin to come. And as the white horse rider comes out, this one world dictator comes in peace, or seemingly peace. The black horse rider, will, or the red horse rider comes with war and bloodshed. The black horse rider comes after war and bloodshed, comes famine and pestilences and diseases. And after that comes the pale or the greenish uh, horse rider which will be symbolic of death and dying that will happen in the world. Let me tell you, the world will suddenly, if they don't know before then, they will suddenly realize that something very catastrophic is happening in the world that they are living in. Let me tell you, we ought to be standing on the mountaintops proclaiming the message of salvation. Let me tell you, this is real. 
It's real. And they're going to see it in real time one of these days. Let me tell you, if you've never trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's the greatest decision. It's the greatest choice that you will ever make in all of life because it will determine whether or not you're here when these things happen or whether you're there. Max Licato said, it's what we do in the here and now that determines the then and the there and how true that is. God bless you for being here tonight. Would you stand with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, no one looking about. We're not going to sing, but if you need to come and give your heart and life to Jesus, would you just during the quietness of these moments with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, would you just ask Jesus to search through your heart and to give you the peace and the assurance to know that you know that you know that you know that you have trusted him as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here tonight and you need a church home. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and speak to you accordingly. Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. God, I pray that you would continue to bless us in our studies. Father, while the world is passing by, going to and fro, may we not be caught off guard. But may we be the watchman on the wall to warn of the dangers that are coming one of these days. Father, speak to our hearts. Teach us. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. We thank you in Jesus' name.